Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on genetics. Now, before you watch this, make sure you're confident with um, DNA and cell division, stem cells, and growth. I've got videos on both of those earlier in the playlist, should you need. Now, now in this video, we will be looking at variation, mutations, what we mean by alleles, the difference between genotype and phenotype, We'll be using Punnett squares and genetic diagrams to predict the outcomes of reproduction. Then we'll look at pedigree charts. And finally, we'll learn a little about the Human Genome Project. So before we go any further, it's just worth recapping quickly our knowledge about DNA. So first of all, DNA is found in the nucleus of animal and plant cells and also freely floating in the cytoplasm of bacterial cells. In terms of its structure, it's got this double helix shape. That is the name for this kind of twisted ladder shape that we got going on there okay the rungs of our ladder are the base pairs and those base pairs are what we call complementary so they can only pair up in a specific way a adenine can only pair with thymine which is t and c cytosine can only pair with g which is guanine so remember that just look at the letter shapes the straight letters go together and the curvy letters go together We've got our sugar phosphate backbone. So these grey sections, kind of the sides of our ladder, um, that's the backbone. And it's made of alternating sugar and phosphate molecules with the bases being attached to the sugar molecules. And lastly, the, complement, the, um, the strands where the complementary base pairs are joined, they're joined by weak hydrogen bonds, which lets you easily unpeel the strands, which is useful um, when DNA is replicated. Now, the next word we're going to be using a lot in this um, uh, video is the idea of a gene. Now, a gene is a section of DNA that contains the code or the instructions to produce a single protein. Now, in your, um, in your um, DNA, in all of your cells right now, you've got about 22,000 different genes, which means you can make 22,000 different proteins. Next, we have the idea of a chromosome. A chromosome is a large DNA molecule containing anywhere between hundreds and thousands of different genes. Now, you should know that um, each of your cells has 46 chromosomes in 23 pairs, and that the chromosomes in a pair contain almost the same genes. There are some small differences which we're going to look at in a second. Lastly, we're going to use this word genome. The genome is the word to refer to the total of all of the DNA in an organism. So your genome is all 46 of your chromosomes. So let's start by looking at genes and variation. Variation is the scientific word to describe the differences between living things. So if we look at these two uh, dogs here you can see that although they're clearly both dogs they've got different shaped heads you know different fur texture different shaped ears different fur color and so on okay now although there is clearly variation between them because they're members of the same species there's less variation than if you were to compare them with say a spider you know those two dogs are clearly much more similar to each other than they are to a spider. They've still got some things in common with the spider, you know, because there are lots of similarities in terms of the machinery inside their cells and the way their cells work. So they're not completely different to spiders, but there is a lot more variation. So you get a lot of variation between species and much less variation within species. Now, where does variation come from? Well, it comes from two sources. The first source is genetic variation. That is variation caused by differences in genes. So for example, the differences in the fur color of those dogs and their texture will be down to genetic variation. There are two sources of genetic variation. One is the idea of mutation. This is about the way that DNA changes over many, many generations. And we'll look at that more on the next slide. The other source is sexual reproduction. So when um, your uh, egg and sperm cells are formed during meiosis, there's kind of a jumbling up of the genes that takes place, and that leads to a big increase in genetic variation, which is the big reason why sexual reproduction is such an effective form of reproduction, because it gets this variety 
into um, a population and we need variation because if all members of a species are identical it means they're all vulnerable to the same threats whereas if they're varied then although a new disease might kill some of them it won't kill all of them now genetic variation is fixed during a lifetime it cannot change you know so that dog's you know there is nothing that can happen to this dog to cause its genes to change its fur from white brown and black to just white like that you know that variation is fixed the other source of variation is environmental variation so this is variation caused by differences in an organism's environment and the different experiences that it has okay for example if i take me i am a, a white male let's say i look roughly like that now depending on what happens to me if i spend more time in the sun i can become more suntanned if i um if i eat a lot more and exercise a lot less i can gain weight so things like the exact tone of my skin how muscly i am um, how uh, how fat or thin i am all those are aspects of environmental variation and importantly they can and do change in their lifetime you know if you look at me in the uh, in the winter when i've barely been outside my skin is much paler than it is in the summer when i've got a nice tan and that's just one aspect of environmental variation and it it can and does change during a lifetime now mutations we mentioned mutations on the previous slide a mutation is a change in the sequence of bases in a molecule of DNA. So for example, if we look carefully, you can see here that the bases there that should be an A and a T, a mutation happens and they become a C and a G instead. Okay. Now, this can happen during cell division. It can also happen as a result of harmful chemicals um, or the effects of radiation mutating the DNA in our cells as well. Now, what mutations do is they can change the order of amino acids in the proteins that a gene codes for, and that can affect the way that the protein works. Mutations that occur in sex cells can affect then the characteristics of the offspring. So, for example, you know, if I had a mutation happen in one of my skin cells, it might be that that skin cell will end up dying but that's you know, no major loss. I've got lots of other spare ones to back me up, but that's not going to affect my offspring. However, if there is a mutation in a sperm cell or an egg cell, that mutation would be passed on to every cell in the child that resulted from that. Okay, so most mutations have no effect. They're neither good nor bad, they just are. Okay, some mutations have a small effect and that effect can be positive, and it can be negative. Rarely, mutations can have a big effect. Now, mutations are the source of the large amount of gen genetic variation seen in populations. So for example, I've got blue eyes, um, and the reason I've got blue eyes is because I've got a mutant gene. Um, you know, the, the normal original color of human eyes is brown, but a, muta a mutated gene appeared something like 10,000 years ago. And so now some people, myself included, have that mutant gene and it's caused that variation that didn't used to be there. Okay, so now we're going to look at the idea of alleles and inheritance. An allele is a different version of the same gene. So, you know, it might be the gene for eye color and that comes in various different um, versions that give rise to these different eye colors. Now you get two alleles of each gene and that is one allele on each of the chromosomes in a pair that also means that you get one allele from each of your parents so if we look here this is our chromosome pair and we've got the same gene but different alleles of that gene and one of them has come from say the father and the other one has come from the mother now alleles can be dominant which means that only one copy is needed to express the characteristic and we write them with a capital letter or they can be recessive which means that two copies are needed to express that characteristic 
and we write those with a lowercase letter. For example, if we think about eye colour, there are two main alleles for eye colour. The dominant allele is the brown eye allele, written with a capital B, and that leads to brown eyes, which we can see uh, there. The other main allele is the recessive blue allele, which is written lowercase b, and that leads to blue eyes. And we can see that here. Now, because the blue eye allele is recessive, we need two copies of it to uh, have blue eyes. So I know because I've got blue eyes, I have two copies of the blue eye allele. If I had one brown allele and one blue eye allele, I would end up with brown eyes exactly the same as if I had two brown alleles. So I need both the recessive copies to give me those blue eyes. OK, so now we're going to meet a couple of words that, we that we'll be using a lot throughout the rest of the video. That is genotype and phenotype. So your genotype is the combination of genes or alleles that you have whilst your phenotype is your features or your characteristics that result from those genes. Now, to remember the difference between these, the genotype, or the geno, rather, in genotype, sounds a bit like genes, and the first sound in pheno goes with the first sound in features. So, geno, genes, pheno, features. It's worth noting as well that your phenotype generally results from multiple different genes interacting. So for example, with your height, it's not just one gene that controls how tall you are, but 40 or 50 genes that all play a small role in how tall you end up being. Now, in terms of your genotype, it can be one of, for any kind of given um, pair of alleles, it can be any one of three combinations. So we can have a homozygous dominant genotype, which means you've got two copies of the dominant allele. It could be a homozygous recessive um, genotype, which means you've got two copies of the recessive allele. And lastly, it can be heterozygous, which means you've got one dominant and one recessive allele. Now, just exploring that language a bit, that word homo always means same. So homozygous means two of the same allele. And hetero always means different. Now, we don't need to say heterozygous dominant or heterozygous recessive because hetero means we've got one dominant and one recessive. So if we apply this idea of genotypes and phenotypes to eye colour, it might work something like this. So your genotype for eye colour could be homozygous dominant, in which case you've got two dominant capital B alleles, and that will result in the brown eye phenotype which we see up here. It could be that your genotype is homozygous recessive, where you've got two of the recessive lowercase b alleles, and that will result in the phenotype blue eyes, which is what we see there. Or it could be that your genotype is heterozygous, um, so that is capital B and lowercase b, one dominant, one recessive allele. That's what we see here. And in this case, you would get brown eyes. And the reason why is because with a dominant allele, you only need one copy of it to express that characteristic. Now, using our knowledge of genotype and phenotype, we need to be able to make predictions about the likelihood of um, particular offspring being produced given the genotype of the parents. So we'll work through a few examples. The first one is this. So what is the chance that a man who is homozygous dominant for eye colour, so BB, capital B, capital B, and a woman who's homozygous recessive, lowercase b, lowercase b, will produce a child with blue eyes? Now, we've got two different ways of looking at this that you need, you need to know about both of them, um, but they will both lead to the same answer. So the first thing we can do is what we call a genetic diagram. And it starts like this. So we start off by writing down the genotype for the male, homozygous dominant, capital B, capital B, and for the female, homozygous recessive, lowercase b, lowercase b. Then we think to ourselves, what will their gametes be? What will their eggs and sperms be? Now, eggs and sperms are haploid. That means they've only got one copy of each allele rather than two. 
And so that will mean that with a man, with a male, all of their sperms will have the dominant allele. And for the female, all of the eggs will have the recessive allele. And so then we just look at how they can combine together. And that works like this. So it could be that they combine like that to produce big B, little b, or that, also big B, little b, or like that, big B, little b, or like that, big B, little b. The alternative we can do is what we call a Punnett square. This is a little grid that you have to do. Now, in the exam, you might be given a diagram like this, but you won't be expected to draw one. Whereas um, with the Punnett square that we're about to see, you are often given uh, questions where you have to draw one of these. So again, it's just worth spending a bit of time thinking about. So first of all, we draw out the grid like that. You'll often be given the grid in an exam. And we just have to say that you know, the rows represent the mother and the columns represent the father. Now, if we remember, the father was BB. That was his genotype. So therefore, his sperms are all going to have the dominant capital B allele. And the mother, if we remember her genotype, was homozygous, homozygous recessive, both lowercase b's. So her eggs are all going to be lowercase b's. So all we then do is just combine them in the grid like this. So they are all getting one dominant capital B from their father and one recessive lowercase b from their mother. So let's come back to the question. What is the chance that they'll produce a child with blue eyes? Well, blue eyes would need to be the homozygous recessive um, genotype. And so all four results are actually the heterozygous big B, little b genotype. And so that will all produce the brown eyes phenotype. So therefore, there is a 0% chance of a child with blue eyes. Okay. Let's look at example number two. Now, in this one, sickle cell um, is a disease caused when a person inherits two copies of a recessive gene. So little s, little s. What is the probability that the child of two parents who are heterozygous for sickle cell, so big S, little s, will not be affected by it? Let's work this through. Now, we're going to start with our genetic diagram. So in our genetic diagram, we draw the genotype of each parent first, so big S, little s, big S, little s, because they're both heterozygous, and then we think about their gametes. So for the male's sperms, half of them will get the dominant big S allele and half the recessive small s allele, and the mother's eggs will be the same as well, so half dominant, half recessive. And now we just look at how they can combine. So it could be that the two dominant big S's come together to make homozygous dominant. It could be that a big S and a little s come together to make heterozygous. And in fact, there are two different ways to achieve that. Uh, or it could be that the two little s's come together to produce homozygous recessive. Now, what about our Punnett square? So on our Punnett square, again, let's think about what the genotypes of the parents are first of all. So they're both heterozygous, big S, little s. And then we can use that to work out the genotypes of their eggs and sperms like this. So both of them, half of the eggs will be um, big S, half little s, and the same with the sperms, half big S, half little s. So now we can combine them to produce homozygous dominant, two heterozygouses, and one homozygous recessive. So now we can come back to the question. And it doesn't matter whether we use the genetic diagram or the Punnett square to answer this, we'll get the same answer. So we're looking for the probability that they will not be affected by it. So the ones that will not be affected by it are either the homozygous dominant, big S, big S, or the heterozygous, big S, little s. So which ones are those? So this will not be affected. Not affected, not affected, is affected. Okay. So not affected, not affected, not affected, is affected. So what we can say then is three out of four have at least one healthy dominant S allele. Therefore, there is a 75% chance of a child being unaffected by sickle cell in this example.
Okay, so our third example is going to be looking at Huntington's disease. Now, it's worth noting, you don't need to know the details of Huntington's disease or sickle cell. Um, that's not the point of this. The point is that you will often in exams be given information like this and have to apply your knowledge of genetics to it. So it's just about being given the information you're, you're uh, in the exam and working with it rather than memorising this stuff. So anyway, Huntington's disease is caused when a person inherits a dominant gene, which we write as capital H. And our question is this, what is the probability that the child of a female who is heterozygous for Huntington's, so that would be big H, little h, and a male who is homozygous recessive, so that would be little h, little h, will develop the condition. So let's start by doing our genetic diagram. So if we do the genotypes of the parents, the male, homozygous recessive, and the female, heterozygous. Now remember, Huntington's is caused by a dominant gene. So in this case, our female is affected by Huntington's and our male is not. So then we do their gametes. So the male sperms will both be the recessive lowercase h gene, uh, genotype, whilst the female will have half of her eggs as the dominant capital H genotype and half of them as the lowercase h. So now we can look at how they might combine together. So we could have big H little h, another big H little h, little h little h, or little h little h like that. Let's try doing the same thing with our Punnett square. Remember, the Punnett squares are the ones you're much more likely to be asked to do in the exam. Now, if we think about our mother, remember our mother is heterozygous, so one of each, and our father is homozygous recessive, so two uh, lowercase h's, and that leads to these gametes. So for the mother, one big h, one little h, and for the father, two little h's, and so they all combine like this to produce a heterozygous, another heterozygous, and two homozygous recessives. So on to the question then, what is the probability that the child of a female who is heterozygous for Huntington's and a male who is homozygous will develop the condition? So the ones that will develop the condition, we're looking for any that are either heterozygous or homozygous dominant. So what do we have? If we look at the genetic diagram, We've got heterozygous, so that one will be affected. And we've got another heterozygous there. That one will. The two homozygous recessives will not. And equally, if we look at the Punnett square, we get the same outcome. Two heterozygouses that will be affected and two homozygous recessives that will not be affected. So therefore, two out of four offspring inherit a dominant H allele, capital H allele, meaning they will develop Huntington's. Therefore, we've got a 50% chance of that child being affected. OK, so now let's look at the last kind of diagram, which is a family pedigree chart. Now, these are charts that show how genetic illnesses can be passed on through a family. And importantly, these are descriptive, not predictive. So the point of a family, family pedigree chart is it's showing the genotypes of the children, the family members that actually existed. It's not about making predictions about who will exist. It's saying this is what actually happened. OK, now let's look at the example of sickle cell. Um, again, you don't need to know about sickle cell, but you will be given examples. And this is a common one. So that's why we're going to work with it. So in sickle cell, there is a dominant healthy capital S allele and a recessive unhealthy lowercase s allele. And so a family pedigree chart might look like this. Now, in a family pedigree chart, there's always a key. So a square is normally used to represent a male and a circle is used to represent a female. If the shape is unshaded, that means that we are completely unaffected by the genetic condition normally. So in that case, it means we are the homozygous dominant genotype. If a square is shaded black, it normally means that the person is affected by the genetic condition. And in this case, that means the homozygous recessive genotype. And if they're half shaded, black and white, what it means is they're a carrier. That means although they've got one healthy dominant allele, 
They've also got one unhealthy recessive allele that could um, pass the condition on to their offspring, even though they themselves are not affected by that condition. So let's look at the first generation of our family. So our, our imaginary couple here, um, our homozygous uh, dominant male and homozygous recessive female have children. Now, all of those children must be carriers. They must be heterozygous because they are all going to inherit one dominant allele from the um, uh, father and one recessive one from the mother. So they must all be what we call carriers. Now, let's see. The one on the left is going to have children with a partner. Now, in this case, you know, just the way it worked out, that partner is also a carrier. So what offspring did they have? Now, there is, you know, there are particular mathematical proportions uh, of how many children of each kind you'd expect them to have. But those are only predictions. This is what actually happened in this case. We end up with one male child who was a, um, uh, a was affected by it, so homozygous um, recessive, a female child who was also homozygous uh, recessive, and a another female child who was completely unaffected, homozygous dominant. Okay, now of those children, the uh, the unaffected um, female ended up having children with a male who was completely unaffected. And so they produced a daughter who was also completely unaffected. And that must be the case because there is no, uh, in this couple here, there is no unhealthy recessive allele for her to inherit. So she must have only got the healthy dominant alleles. Now, let's come back up to our first generation and look up here. So our one of our heterozygous children uh, had children with a unaffected male, so capital S, capital S, okay. and they end up producing a son who was completely unaffected, so capital S, capital S, and also another son who was a carrier, heterozygous, capital S, lowercase s. Now, if that son had children with an affected female, this is what happened in this case. So they produced two daughters who were both affected, lowercase s, lowercase s, homozygous recessive. Another daughter who was unaffected but is a carrier, so heterozygous, and a son who is also heterozygous. Now, they all had to inherit at least one recessive allele because the mother only has recessive alleles, but some of them got the dominant good one from their, their father and some of them got the recessive unhealthy one from their mother. Now, you can see quite quite a lot of interesting things in this. Um, so one of the things that you, you might often hear about genetics is sometimes genes can skip a generation. Genes can't skip a generation because you know, they can't just disappear and reappear. But what this shows is the way that the, the traits expressed by some genes do skip a generation. Because, for example, the first generation of our family here, none of them had sickle cell. But because they were all carriers, they were able to have children themselves who then were affected. So that's an example of the characteristic skipping a generation. But the genes definitely didn't skip a generation. Now, these family pedigree charts are super important because they allow families affected by genetic illnesses to make informed decisions about them. So, you know, I know, for example, um, I, I had a colleague um, who was from an ethnic uh, community where there's a much greater incidence of sickle cell. And in fact, her own sister died from sickle cell. And so she knew there was sickle cell in her family and she did this kind of pedigree analysis and she was so so worried about the risk of sickle cell and having grandchildren with sickle cell that she, um, she essentially tried to instruct her family, don't have children you know, with, with people from the same ethnic group as us because the risk of sickle cell is too high. Now, I don't really agree with her choices there, but I can certainly understand where she was coming from. Perhaps a better approach, an approach that can be taken, is that if you know there's a gen genetic illness in your family, is you can have um, counselling and treatment through doctors, uh, with, with doctors, to help you make better informed decisions. Um, and there are things that can be done, for example, like um, uh, embryo screening, where you... Um, you produce some embryos in a um, 
in, in, in the lab and you only implant the ones into the uterus that have been shown to not have the harmful combinations of genes. The last thing to look at is what we call the Human Genome Project. So the Human Genome Project was a project to map the sequence of all of the 3.1 billion base pairs that are present in the human DNA. Now, this project ran from about 1990 to 2003, and it cost around 3 billion US dollars. Now, with modern technology, we can achieve the same in about five hours for about $600. So, you know, this was a massive, massive achievement, and it's enabled this huge development in technology that now makes this same achievement actually quite an easy thing to do. Now, you don't need these details here. That's just there for context. But you do need to know that this is what the Human Genome Project did. Now, this was a really super important thing with lots of benefits. So benefit number one is it helps us to identify genes associated with illnesses. So, for example, with breast cancer, this is an X-ray of a healthy breast. And that there is a tumour in someone with breast cancer. Now, there are particular genes called BRCA1 and BRCA2 that make it much more likely that um, someone will develop breast cancer. And so you can now get genetic tests to test whether you've got those genes. And that helps you make decisions about your health kind of choices that can reduce those chances of getting breast cancer. So you know, a lot of women, when they learn they've got these genes, they choose to have their breasts removed and replaced with prosthetic breasts because that means they can't get breast cancer and they can't die from it. In fact, the, the film star Angelina Jolie made exactly that choice. Um, that would not have been possible without the Human Genome Project doing that work to sequence the genome in the first place. Another important benefit is understanding, identifying and treating genetic illnesses. You know, For example, things like sickle cell or Huntington's and some of the other things we've looked at in this uh, video. It helps us to map and to un analyze and to understand human migration patterns and human evolution. So that's the Human Genome Project, sequencing the, um, the bases in DNA in order to help with both medicine and our wider understanding of the history of the human race. Okay, so that's it, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.